When I was a grad student, I had an uncle at Thanksgiving supper one year who held forth with a diatribe that concluded with the pronouncement that math was just numbers. Well, I was rather surprised to learn that, especially since I'd spent the better part of five years as a math major. Still, my uncle was adamant, and eventually I felt compelled to fetch one of the textbooks that I had brought home for break. I showed it to him. It was Jacobson's Basic Algebra I. That's a title to put you in your place. Unless you're a math major, too, you might have the wrong idea about this book. Abstract algebra is an advanced branch of mathematics dealing with groups, rings, fields, ideals, and other things with familiar sounding names that don't mean anything like what they sound like. In abstract algebra, you do things like prove that the polynomial ring of a unique factorization domain is a UFD itself. I'll admit, I took the book to my uncle and handed it to him with a bit of arrogance and invited him to show me the just numbers. He flipped through some pages, frowning, and then stopped. All right, he said, pointing. Here. I followed his finger and felt I had made my point. So I took the book back and I dropped the subject. He was pointing to a page number. My point is that you have to be careful about trivializing things. And I want to make sure that I'm not guilty of that. One of my goals in creating this course was to present some key ideas of game theory in a way that normal, intelligent human beings could understand and hopefully enjoy. But in doing so, I could be giving you the idea that the people who got Nobel Prizes for game theory, for example, were given some kind of a pass. I mean, how hard is the idea of a Nash equilibrium once you see it? Well, there's a lot more to it, almost all of it, than what I've told you. Doing game theory involves some pretty sophisticated mathematics and some very sophisticated thinking. And for the most part, I haven't even given you a clue about this. For example, what does it look like when an economist analyzes an economic problem using game theory? Well, this is a survey course, so I'm not going to ripcord you into the twilight zone of mathematics. But I wanted to include just a little bit more of what such an analysis might look like. This lecture is an attempt to split the difference. I want to talk about a practical, not too technical economics question and use a bit deeper analysis than what I have or will use in the rest of the lectures. For any of you not really fond of mathematics, treat this the way that you might treat a tour of a medieval cathedral. Don't bother trying to focus on the details. Just let it soak in a bit. The math is going to be pretty accessible, but the ideas I'm developing really won't require you to follow it if you'd rather not, and it won't be needed for any of the rest of the course. We're at the base of a very long spiral stairwell in this lovely old cathedral. I'm going to take you just a few turns up, hoping that the view from there will give you just a little better view, a little better sense of how grand, how majestic, this whole place is. I'm going to be looking at what econ economists term oligopolies, markets in which there are only a small number of competitors. If there's only one competitor, it's called a monopoly. If there are two, it's called a duopoly. The monopoly situation isn't really a game because there's only one player. Still, it serves as a useful starting point. So let's look at what a monopolist should do. We'll assume that the monopolist wants to maximize profit. Anyone who's going to buy what the monopolist has to sell is going to buy it from the monopolist. That's what makes the situation a monopoly. Of course, whether an individual buys what the monopolist makes depends upon the price that she charges. Unless things are really strange, we'd expect that the more that she charges, the less people would want to buy. This information is generally represented by a demand curve. I'm going to draw it the way that economists often do, with price on the vertical axis and quantity demanded on the horizontal. Here's a demand curve. Each point on the red curve shows a price-quantity combination. On this demand curve, if you sell your product really cheaply, for about 50 cents, lots of people want to buy it, around 6,000 or so. That's way over on the right of the demand curve. The more you charge, the less people want to buy. As you move up on the vertical axis, you move left on the horizontal one. You can see from the graph that if you charge $40 a unit, no one wants to buy your product at all. 
This demand curve is only one possible demand curve, of course. For different products, the demand curve can have different shapes, although it'll generally run downhill from upper left to lower right. For some products, like gasoline, a small bump in price has very little effect on the amount demanded. Economists call such demands inelastic. Other products, like generic beans, might have a highly elastic demand. You bump the prices on such products a little bit, people are going to buy a lot less. So, the monopolist wants to maximize her revenues. How much should she charge? If she charges too little, she sells a lot of product, but makes almost nothing on each unit. If she charges too much, no one, or almost no one, buys the product. So again, the profits are quite small. Somewhere between these two points lies the best value. Let's look at a particular example to see how this approach would work. We'll stick with the demand curve that I just showed you, and suppose that the monopolist decides to charge uh, $13. We can see from the graph that she'll sell about 1,000 units. How much revenue does she make? Well, $13 for each of 1,000 units gives her 13 times 1,000, or $13,000. In general, revenue equals the number of units sold times the price per unit. This observation gives us a graphical way of understanding the monopolist situation. The shaded rectangle in my graphic is 1,000 units wide and 13 units tall, giving it an area of 13,000. Remember, the area of a rectangle is its width times its height. So, numerically, the revenue that the monopolist gets is the same as the area of that rectangle. She wants to pick the point on the curve whose rectangle would have the biggest possible area. Here are two lousy choices. Too high up on the curve and the rectangle's tall, but too skinny. Too far down on the curve and it's wide, but too short. These two rectangles have less area than our first one, so they provide less revenue, too. Actually, the monopolist goal is slightly different from what I said. We've been looking at revenues, but ignoring the cost of making the units sold. If the monopolist wants to maximize profits, like I said, she has to maximize revenues minus costs. Now, there are some costs, like the cost of her factory, that won't change regardless of how many units she makes and sells. These are called fixed costs. Since they're fixed, we can ignore them in figuring out how many units she should make. It's kind of like if you want to maximize how much money you have at the end of the day. There'll be how much you started the day with and how much you gained a day. But you really can't change how much you started with. That's fixed. So maximizing your total money at the end of the day comes down to the same thing as maximizing how much you make today. Still, ignoring fixed costs, there's still costs associated with making the unit. That's called the variable cost. In our problem, if the monopolist had to pay $5 to make her product, if she had a variable cost of $5 per unit, that's going to cut into her profits. Our earlier example had her selling 1,000 units for $13 each. That gave her a revenue of 1,000 times 13, $13,000. But if five of those dollars had to go to pay to make the unit itself, then she only gets 13 minus five, or $8 per unit. Her profit, ignoring fixed costs, is then eight times 1,000, $8,000. We can show this new situation on the graph, too. We'll draw a horizontal line at the $5 variable cost. Only the area above this line goes into profit. What's below it goes into paying variable cost. Now you can see what the monopolist is really trying to do. Draw a rectangle sitting on top of the variable cost line and tucked up underneath the demand curve. Find the one that has the biggest area, because that's going to give her the biggest profit. Well, these pictures are great for intuition, but they can only get us so far. To actually find which rectangle we need, we're going to need to do some calculation. So let me show you how we can do this. To keep the math simple, I'm going to choose some equations that work out nicely, but this same approach can be used with any demand curve and any variable cost. Let's assume that you're making uh, bent wood chairs. No one wants to buy your chair for more than 700 bucks, but every time that you drop your price by two bucks, you increase your demand by one person. If P is your selling price and Q is how many you sell, these statements correspond to saying that P is equal to 700 minus 2Q. Let's take a second to get comfortable with what this demand equation is saying. You can see that as Q, the quantity sold, goes up, the price has to come down. 
so the demand curve is downward sloping, as we'd expect. In fact, by the time that you get to Q equals 350, the demand equation says that your, sell your selling price has to be 700 minus 2 times 350, which is zero. You can't sell more than 350 chairs, even if you're willing to give them away. Those of you who remember graphing equations may be able to tell that this particular demand equation graphs as a straight line. Because of this, it's called a linear demand curve. I chose a linear demand curve for mathematical simplicity. By the way, mathematicians call such graphs curves even when they're straight. Go figure. All right, let's assume that your variable costs are $100 per chair. That is, it costs you $100 in material, labor, packaging, transport, so on. So, what price should you charge for the chair? And how many chairs should you make? Well, ignoring fixed costs, we reason like this. Your profit is how much you make per chair times the number of chairs that you sell. That's easy. The amount you make per chair is the selling price, P, minus your variable cost, which we said was 100. So your profit is P minus 100 times Q. This expression has two variables in it, and calculations are easier in expressions that have only one variable. We can get rid of one variable if we remember the demand equation. The demand equation tells us what P is if we know Q. Ah, and here it is. So, the profit, max, uh, the profit equation that we just found will replace P with 700 minus 2Q. Again, folks, don't let the math make you woozy. This lecture should make sense even if you gloss over the equations and the calculations. If you're a math fan, enjoy seeing into the guts of this process. When it comes to actually doing game theory, it's mathematics. Working out the details of what actually happens often involves a fair amount of crunching. So let's look at the last bit of work again. You can see the replacements in blue. P gets replaced with 700 minus 2Q from the demand equation. When the smoke clears, we've got a nice expression for your profit. It depends only on the number of chairs you sell, Q. And it tells you the profit that you make with that number of chairs. If you sell 100 chairs, you make 600 times 100 minus 2 times 100 squared, which works out to be $40,000. If you sell 300 chairs, you make 600 times 300 minus 2 times 300 squared, which is zero. That might seem weird, but it's right. Remember the demand equation, which tells you the selling price for any quantity. If you sell 300 shares, they sell for, according to your demand equation, $100 each. And that's just enough to cover your variable costs of 100 per chair. So with 300 shares, you make no profit at all. So, how do we find the best quantity, the best value of Q? I'm going to assume that if you're a person who would actually care about the answer to that question, you probably know at least a little bit of calculus. And that's the easiest way to find the optimal value of Q. Take the derivative of the profit function, set it equal to zero, and solve for Q. If you don't know calculus, you can do it with algebra, or by drawing a graph, or by trial and error. Or you can ask a friend or subordinate who does know calculus to do it for you. Economists usually use the symbol pi, to represent profit. It has nothing to do with the 3.14159 that you remember from geometry. It's just that we're talking about profit, which starts with the letter P, and we've already used the letter P for price. Pi is the Greek equivalent for P, so the profit is 600Q minus 2Q squared, and the derivative of this is 600 minus 4Q. Setting this equal to zero gives you that Q should be 150 chairs. That means that you sell them for 700 minus 2 times 150, or $400 each, and you make $45,000. And this really is the best you can do. If you sold just one less chair, 149, you can work out that you'd make $44,998, $2 less. If you sold one more chair, you'd make that same amount of money. As a monopolist, you want to make exactly 150 chairs, then sell them for $400 each and pocket 45,000 bucks. Not bad. But what if you have competition? If there are two firms in the market, a monopoly becomes a duopoly. For simplicity, I'm going to assume that I'm your competitor and that I have chairs and businesses virtually identical to yours, down to, even down to my variable costs, $100 per chair. 
Since shoppers are going to look for the best price, we're going to end up charging essentially the same price for chairs. That price will depend upon the total number of chairs that together we put out on the market. That is, the demand equation will now look like, look like, look like this. It's still 700 minus 2Q, but now that Q is made up of two parts, your contribution and mine. Yours is Q1, mine is Q2. I'm going to give you one advantage, however. Since you're established in the market and I'm the new kid, I'm going to assume that you have the power to decide your production level first. Once you do that, I'll know your level and I'll choose mine with your production in mind. This is a sequential situation, and it's what economists call a von Stackelberg duopoly. Let's analyze it. The basic idea is very much what we just did with the monopolist. The only difference is that now, your profits depend both on your choice and on mine. That's true for me too, of course. Let pi 1 be your profits, and pi 2 be mine. Again, pi is just the Greek letter for P. The profit doesn't have anything to do with pi r squared and that stuff. Take a look. Just as before, your profit is the profit you get per chair times the number of chairs that you sell. But now that selling price of chairs depends on the total number of chairs that you and I together put on the market. In the first row, I called this Q. In the second row, I showed that this was the same as Q1, your production, plus Q2, mine. The third row is just algebra, simplifying the second row. The final expression looks identical to the one that we got when you were a monopolist, except for that minus 2Q1, Q2 term in the middle. See it? That shows that the higher Q2 is, the more chairs that I put on the market, the worse it is for your profit. So my competition is going to hurt your profits, and the more that I make, the worse it is for you. You could have guessed that, of course, but now you know by exactly how much. But my goal isn't to hurt you, of course. My goal is to maximize my profits. The logic that I use to find profits, yours, works equally well for me. The math will be just the same except that I'll use Q2, my production, rather than Q1, your production, in computing the profits. Here are the changes in blue. And whether you follow the math or not, we are now stuck smack dab in the middle of a game. You're going to pick your production level Q1. In response, after learning what that is, I'm going to pick my production level Q2. Once we know these two numbers, the equations we just found will tell us the profit that each one of us makes. It's a sequential game of perfect information, since you go first and I know your decision when I make my choice. But it's not a finite game, since you can choose any production level you want, and so can I. Because of that, I can't really draw a proper decision tree for this sequential game. Each of us would have an infinite number of choices in each decision node. Still, we can apply the principles learned in Lecture 2. Remember, to look forward, you must reason backward. So let's start at the end with me. Remember my goal. It's to maximize my profit, which looks like this. I want to make my profit as big as possible. I'm going to use the same calculus-based approach that I used in the monopolist case. I'll take the derivative of my profit expression and set it equal to zero, and see what the best value of 2q, q2, that I can get is. Now, you might not be happy about my doing this, since this expression has two variables in it, not just one. But in a real sense, it doesn't. When I make my move, I already know your choice of q1. It'll just be a number, like 50, or 100, or 200, whatever production level you happen to choose. In any case, it certainly won't change, as I toy with my own various production levels. So, I can treat your Q1 as if it were just a number in my analysis. I don't know what that number is at the moment, but nothing that I do is going to change it. The formal way of saying this is that I'm going to take the partial derivative of profit, treating Q2 as the only variable. When I do, here's what happens. My profit is the same expression we had before, and then we take the derivative with respect to q2 in the second row, and I get just 600 minus 2q1 minus 4q2. I set this equal to zero, and solving for q2 gives me, after a little bit of algebra, that q2 equals the quantity 300 minus q1 over 2. Again, if the calculation isn't interesting to you, feel free to just take the results as given. The last line tells us what we need to know. 
my response function is Q2 equals the quantity 300 minus Q1 over 2. What do I mean by this? Well, remember, I make my decision of how many chairs to produce after I already know your decision, Q1. With this information in hand, the work that I just did shows me how many chairs I should make. For example, if you make no chairs, Q1 would be 0. I should make 300 minus 0 over 2, or 150 chairs. Not surprising, really. If you don't make any chairs, then I'd be the monopolist. And so I'd do exactly what you did as a monopolist, make 150 chairs. If you make 300 chairs, Q1 would be 300, then I should make 300 minus 300 over 2, or 0 chairs. I shouldn't make any. This isn't a surprise either. Remember that we saw earlier that when you make 300 chairs, it depresses the market value of a chair to $100, just enough to cover your, fixed co uh, your variable costs. If I make any chairs, it will lower the selling price to below $100. I'll actually lose money on every chair that I make. For any quantity between 0 and 300 that you might decide to make, I can use my handy-dandy equation to figure out the best response, the number of chairs that I should add to the market to make as much money for myself as I can. The equation tells me how to respond to any decision that you make. That's why we call it my response function. Now, I know what I'll do regardless of the decision that you make. And, and this is the important point. So do you. Everything that we just did was to figure out how I'd respond to your production level. The analysis required no secret information to figure out my response function. You could do the exact same calculation that I just did. So you know that I'm going to produce 300 minus Q1 over 2 units, just like my response function says I will. I can't do better. So, what will your profit look like? Let's go back to the expression for your profit that we found about five minutes ago. Ah, there it is. You can see that, again, we have a little problem. It's got both a Q1 and a Q2 in it. When we were dealing with my profit, we got around that easily enough. By the time I made my decision, your value, Q1, was just a number that I already knew. It was etched in stone and nothing I could do could change it. But that's not the case here. My choice of Q2 is going to depend on your choice of Q1. In fact, we know exactly how it will depend on your choice. That's what my response function was all about. Here's your profit, and here's my response function. Aha. Uh -huh. And that's the key to cracking this nut. The response function lets me replace my decision, Q2, with an expression that only depends on your decision, Q1. And that's just what I'm going to do. Take a look. We start with your profit function. Then I replace that pesky Q2 with the value of Q2 that's given in my response function. And after that, it's just algebra. In the end, we have an expression for your profit that depends only on your decision, which is just what we wanted. Okay. Now, I play the same old game. Take the derivative of this, set it equal to zero, and find out what Q1 should be. The derivative of your profit is 300 minus 2q1, and this is equal to 0 only when q1 equals 150. Again, you can do this by graphing, or trial and error, or by algebra if you wanted. It would just be more time consuming. Well, the result is pretty darned interesting, and rather surprising. If you were a monopolist, remember, your best choice was to make 150 chairs. If you did, you made $45,000. Now you've got me as a competitor, but you get to go first. And your best choice in light of that is still to make 150 chairs. You basically ignore my presence. This isn't a result of the particular numbers that I chose. It's a general result. Does this mean that I don't affect your business? Not at all. Let's compute your profit. Your profit is 300Q1 minus Q1 squared. When we plug in Q1 equals 150, we get your profit as $22,500. <laughs> wow. Your profit has been cut exactly in half. Does that mean that I get the other half? Let's see. How many chairs do I make? 
my response function tells me. Since Q1 is 150, I make 300 minus 150, all divided by 2. That's 75. So I only make half as many chairs as you do. Since we both sell them at the same price with the same variable cost, that means I only make half as much money as you do too. 11,250. Since together we're making 225 chairs, the demand function tells us that the selling price is 700 minus 2 times 225, $250, down from the $400 per chair that you got when you were a monopolist. When people talk about how competition is good for the consumer, this is what they mean. My competition changed your best equilibrium from $400 to chair, per chair to $250, and as a result, more people bought chairs. They just didn't buy them from you. This actually generalizes in a neat way as long as the demand function is linear and all the firms in the market had the same variable cost. We saw that when I entered your market, it didn't change your behavior, but it cut your profits in half. We also saw that I produced half as many units as you did and made only half as much money. If a third producer now entered the market, you and I would stick with our current production levels, and the new person would produce only half as much as I make. But her entry would again cut all of our profits in half. And this pattern would repeat with every additional entry. If we have a market with a lot of firms competing, our profits would all get whittled down to essentially zero. Well, this analysis has been based on a sequential game. First, you set your quantity, then I set mine. And that's what makes it a von Stackelberg duopoly. But you can certainly imagine this being played as a simultaneous game, where we both make our decisions independently. Then it's called a Cournot duopoly, after Antoine Augustin Cournot, a 19th century Frenchman who first studied it. I'm not going to go through all the details of the analysis, although it's very similar to what we've done. Essentially, we find my response function to you and your response function to me. This tells each of us how we'd like to respond to a choice made by the other player. Now, the only way to have a Nash equilibrium for the values of Q1 and Q2 that we pick is to have them satisfy both your response function and mine simultaneously. By solving the two equations simultaneously, you'll find out that the only answer is to have both Q1 and Q2 equal to 100. We both make 100 shares, which sell for $300 each, giving each firm a profit of $20,000. I want you to notice something. $20,000 for you and $20,000 for me adds up to $40,000, while you could make $45,000 on your own as a monopolist. If I were the only firm that was threatening entry into your market, you could pay me a little over $20,000 to stay out. Our model says that we'll both get more money that way. It'd be bad for the consumers, but it'd be great for us. In fact, this happens in real life. In 2002, the FTC filed charges against two pharmaceutical companies, Andrix in Florida and Herxt in Germany. Herxt allegedly paid Andrix $40 million a year not to market their generic equivalent to Herxt's Cardison CD, a heart medicine. Using legislation that gives the first manufacturer of a generic drug a time window to have exclusive license to the generic, the two firms evidently created a bottleneck that made it impossible for any other firm to enter the market. A similar case was made against two other companies in the same year. The FCC also nailed Abbott Laboratories and Geneva Pharmaceuticals. Abbott was paying Geneva $4.5 million per month to keep the generic version of Abbott's drug Hytrin off the shelves. Now, I'm sure that these firms didn't have linear demand curves or identical variable costs or perfect substitutability or identical pricing schemes. In short, the situation that we analyze today is not a perfect description of these real-world cases. But our simplification may have allowed us to see into the guts of this sort of interaction and to understand what forces would motivate a firm to make such an offer or to take it. It's another example of Selton's observation that our examples are useful in part precisely because they are relatively simple. When you strip a situation down to its essentials, it's surprising how often you'll be looking at a game.